Hi everyone, my name is James Feeney. Welcome to or back to my channel. Today we are going to be going through my favorite things from the month of May, along with a few memorable experiences and noteworthy items. Without further ado, I jump into the decks that I'm going to be sharing. I follow that up with the books where I give brief synopsis of the books along with a bit of a review and rating. And I follow that up with some miscellaneous magical spiritual, spiritual related items and culminate with some experiences and just things that have happened, some thoughts and musings on the month at large. So we'll jump in with those decks. I'll say that the decks tend to be the most boring part in my opinion because I don't switch them up very often in recent months and even the last year. I will say the Thoth definitely made more of a comeback. I have been studying the Marseille. If you watch my channel, you may know that, but I've been missing my time with the Thoth and it's always been close at hand. It's never been far away, but I've been engaging with it a little bit more. The level of comfort and just the desire to interact with this imagery has been very prevalent. I think that has to do with maybe some of the hazy feelings I had from the month of May and April where I felt kind of out of it. Returning to something that felt really familiar and comforting and excitable for me was just what I needed. So the Thoth made a comeback. That was the my greenie and the trimmed version of course was always around as well. I feel like I can take this anywhere and not have to worry about what happens to it and it's also the one that I use with clients. So that's always going to be around. There were some Marseille decks around that studying did not entirely discontinue. I would say the one I used the most is this version or reproduction of the Dodal by Cartogram. Cartogram with a K and it's all one word. They have an Etsy shop and a website. They're on, this is on linen cardstock, about standard tarot size. It shuffles like a dream. I think it's more of the tactile experience that I favor with this one. So when picking a Marseille, when I guess many could argue that there's a lot of similarity between Marseille decks, this to me is the one that I found myself drawn to the most, mostly just for comfort and because it's pretty standard and straightforward. And I find that the one linen cardstock and two, the coloration and just the way the reproduction was done is... I would say very aesthetically and visually pleasing for me, so that's probably the one that made its appearance known the most. Aside from that, I would say decks that I used would be the Holistic Astrology or Astrological Cards for Guidance, Forecasting, and Healing by Carni Zor. I think I've mentioned these a couple times in the past few months. The reflective front makes it a bit hard to see, but these are essentially just astrology cards that have, for example, the planets, the signs, the houses, along with a few other things. I like the fact that it seems to bridge both Eastern and Western ideologies where astrology is concerned and my astrology studies have been ramping up more so in recent months. And so I favor these when I do astrological add-ons for clients. I break these cards out, but I've also just enjoyed it to visualize my own chart or maybe when I'm studying a book and trying to get a better grasp or understanding of a concept visually. I found this to be really helpful. I know there are a lot of astrology decks out there, but to me, this one has more of, I don't know, I'm, I would say more of an excitability to it. It doesn't just have, for example, a sector of a chart or it doesn't just tell you a given thing. There's something about it that's more interpretive, which I appreciate in an Oracle deck. So that one would be a big favorite for me from the month. And then two playing cards to share or two playing card decks to share. I just made a video on playing cards and delving into studies for anybody who is interested. I'll try to link that around. But the ones that I've been using, this one I show every month, the Pagan Playing Cards by Usi, no need to elaborate much further there. And then the Hermes Playing Card Oracle by Robert M. Place. I mentioned that I've been loving this one for clients. It does mirror or is a really suitable option for Lenormand readers out there. Each card does have a very distinctive image, and for all of the cards that would correlate or correspond to their, I would say, counterpart in the Lenormand, the illustration is the same as it would be in a Lenormand deck. But then for every other card that wouldn't be in a Lenormand deck, there is still an illustration on the playing card. So 
I don't tend to read it in the Lenormand fashion, but I do like to draw upon the very simple elements that might be included for any of the cards, whether it's a storm cloud or shaking hands or a tower, which this would be a Lenormand counterpart, but I have been enjoying it for client readings in that way. So that takes us through the decks. I'm pretty standard and I guess a little bit, yeah, boring when it comes to those. I like to stick with what I know and really try to get the most out of any deck that I use as opposed to bouncing and flitting around a lot. I didn't pull out the Tarot of the She, but that one's been making in the last week or so a bit of an appearance, but not noteworthy enough to be showcased here. But that's one that tends to be seasonal, seasonal for me. Now I'll jump into the books. So we have four, which tends to be the case for me when it comes to books in a month. The first one that I have to share and show would be The ABCs of Astrology, A Beginner's Guide to Becoming Your Own Astrologer by uh, Dearisha Mack. I think I showed this on Instagram or may have spoken to the fact that I intended to read it on my travels when I was away at the earlier part of this month and for the latter part of the last month. I finished this book, really enjoyed it, would highly recommend it to any beginner out there. I like the fact that it was extremely relatable and there were some pop culture elements thrown in. So for a younger audience or for somebody who's trying to make sense of the concepts in terms of things that you see in everyday life, I found that to be extremely helpful. There was also a lot of situational and anecdotal storytelling going on in connection to any of the signs, planets, houses, and the understanding of those types of things and aspects, along with breakdowns of certain charts done in a way that I think was really, really helpful, where you get to then take the knowledge you've learned in the first part of the, of the reading and apply it, but more in a guided way where the author is taking you through how they might use that knowledge you learned to then interpret a chart and using that chart of somebody who is very noteworthy. I know one example used was Whitney Houston and breaking down her career up into the later part of her days um, and even some, I guess, more predictive aspects in terms of her um, her passing. So found this to be really, really helpful. Uh, this one was recommended by Queen Osset actually when I think it was our last sort of panel where we spoke about diversity and trying to diversify our shelves, our bookshelves in terms of a lot of different areas. I remember I was writing down a bunch on astrology because that's a big area for, of study for me at this point. And this was the first one I got and decided to read and it did not disappoint. So 10 out of 10 would recommend this one. The next book I have here is The Missing Moon by Noel uh, Till Tile. This one came out, I believe, in the 80s, if I'm not mistaken. This is an older copy I got used on Amazon at the time of purchase. It was kind of like not in stock, I guess, in paperback. So I had to order a used one and it came much later. So I got into it a bit later into the month, but it's a quick read. It's not very long. It's in a more novel style. So although it's about astrology and written by a professional astrologer, it is more of a narrative and fictional process. It follows the storyline of uh, our protagonist, Mr. Mercury. He's a professional astrologer and it takes place in the 70s. It's very interesting to see how astrology has advanced and changed and how difficult things kind of were for astrologers back um, just a few decades when charts had to be drawn up by hand and we didn't have computer programs where we could just input dates and birthdays. Uh, where the ephemeris was definitely something that needed to be pulled out very often. And then, of course, the actual drawing of a chart with the angles and protractions and all of those sorts of things. It's almost It almost reads like a sitcom to me because each chapter, although we're, we're following the same protagonist, he has a different case each chapter. So they're almost like short stories, but they do connect and there is a continuity between them all. So I would venture to call it a novel, but you might also look at it in a way that seems like a series of short stories that you could read very separately and still get a lot out of. The astrology in this is rather in-depth, and so you are kind of learning as you are hearing the story. There's one chapter where he tries to find a murderer through astrology and birth charts. There's another where, I'm trying to think, where there's just like a, a bunch of predictive elements. I will say it's a little bit farther fetched and that's what makes it fictional while the charts are real and there are aspects spoken about. Oftentimes in this you'll see, for example, the very grandiose Mr. Mercury who's larger than life looking at somebody and being able to divine their chart by their appearance and a lot of sort of deductive reasoning which seems very Sherlock Holmes-esque. 
there's a bunch of fantastical elements, but nonetheless, I would say the ast the astrology when you boil it down is real, it's accurate, and you can still learn from it. And then at the same time, it's very fun to read. So I would recommend this one, especially for anybody who wants to know what astrology in just a few decades prior was like for anybody out there looking to practice in that way. Uh, very, very interesting. Definitely would recommend this one. And then we have A People's History of the Vampire Uprising by Raymond A. Uh, Valerio. This one took me a while to read. I started it last month. It dragged for me. Uh, this is probably one of the first times I'm showcasing a book in a recap or favorites or on my channel that I actually maybe wouldn't recommend. It depends on who you are. Um, it took me a while to get through it. I kind of wanted to almost persevere out of spite or just to get through it to tell myself or to prove to myself that I could. I will, okay, let's get into the plot, I guess. It is a larger book or a larger novel, I guess you could say. Uh, essentially, what this is about is the idea that vampires exist or that a vampire strain of a virus uh, comes into being and it's bloodborne and it's more through a societal, political, socioeconomic perspective. So, if, for example, vampirism or something akin to that were to arise or exist currently, present day, how would that look politically? What sort of movements would we see in social media and social climates in the political sphere? Would it be, for example, um, something that you have the idea of like people not accepting vampires because, of course, there's a lot of like crime and all these sorts of things. In the book, they're kind of depicted as very charming and then kind of get the better hand of a lot of people um, who people who can't see through, I guess, that exterior, but ultimately it seems as though they're kind of like sociopaths who then need to feed on people and commit crimes, but they're kind of high highbrow people at the same time where the vampires choose to recreate, as they call it, very important, rich, notable figures in the world, and they do have a sort of plan for domination, um, but then there comes in the, the issues of, for example, do they get uh, are they up for disabilities in the workforce because they can't come out during the day? Are they suitable, for example, to be politicians? What does it look like when they want to play in sports? Is it discrimination to then not allow them to play? Like, there's a lot of that going on in this, so it's more through that lens, if that makes sense. Or what does it look like when one of the vampires decides to run for um, office? Or if one were to become the Pope? Things like that. There are multiple perspectives going on, which is what made it the most difficult to latch on to and remain interested. You get the perspective of a woman who discovered the virus, who works for the CDC. You get the perspective of a prominent sort of political figure who helps to run campaigns. You get the perspective of somebody who works close to the Pope or I believe is a cardinal at the Vatican. So those are three returning characters, but there are many chapters in between that are one-offs where we aren't quite sure what's going on, or a whole chapter that's basically just a court case or court hearing, and it's done in a very technical fashion, and you're not sure when we're going to see these protagonists again, or if we're not, or if we are. Um, and then, of course, there are some people that come in for just a chapter, and you just get a section on them, and maybe you liked them or you didn't, and then they don't reappear. So it made it hard to follow it along. And then the timeline jumps around a bit as well. I will say I think the writing was done so well, it, it takes a lot to build a world of this caliber and scale and to really see through and predict on a global way what this sort of virus could have done. I think it was highly realistic in that way. Um, so for some out there, this may be your cup of tea. For me, it just took a lot out of me to really remain engaged throughout the entirety of it. So this one would be more of like maybe a three or four out of 10 if I had to rate it. But for some people, it may be a 10 out of 10, but that's what it was for me. So that's our third book. The final book I read, and I have it up on my laptop, or at least the information about it on my laptop, because I listened to it as an audiobook on my drive back from Florida, which was essentially 17 or 18 hours. I decided to listen to a novel, having listened to an astrology book on my way there and realizing that for technical information, audiobooks maybe are not the way to go, I decided to give audiobooks another try with fiction. So I read The Queen of Nothing by Holly Black. It's the third installment in a series, uh, the series being called The Folk of Air Books. They are essentially about the fair folk, fairies, fae, 
in a more fantasy driven land. I would say, I think it's, they are considered young adult or YA in their category, YA fantasy. I read the first two in paperback, the first one being The Cruel Prince, the second being The Wicked King, and apparently there is a fourth, although I kind of thought this would be the end, but upon searching, now there is How the King of Elfheim Learned to Hate Stories. So there is a fourth one either coming or it may be out. I'm, it's kind of ambiguous here on Amazon. And I know Holly Black has written another more one-off type book that functions within the world of this series, and there is some overlap in terms of character and plot. So there's a lot that goes into this for... Any, I'm just trying to give some context, but essentially it's about uh, a human girl who grew up in the fairyland along with her twin sister and her half-sister who is half fairy or half fae, and basically navigating the dynamics of a court system. We're in the third installment, so a lot has taken place, and I don't want to give away too many spoilers, but at this point, a lot has already been accumulated. They're entrenched deeply in the midst of these uh, court dramas and dynamics, and there are themes of romance and murder and mystery and all of those sorts of things. And of course, if you're interested in fantasy and more fairy folklore, this is going to appeal to you. I will say, given the fact that I've ha read a decent amount on the fae, the fair folk, and all of uh, the mythology surrounding that, this seems to be very accurate in the way that it uses that folklore and mythology in a fictional way. So a lot of what you're reading is quite true to the mythology, is true to the cultures that it's derived from. It does seem to be more Celtic, I would say, if I had to narrow it down to the sect or specificity of a fair folk and fae that they're referencing. So it is more Celtic in that way. Uh, it's not super fluffy, so there is things like, of course, like I said, murder and trickery, and it is more of that dark side, you know what I mean? Not necessarily the the pixies that are that we would see more in a Victorian painting, much more so the, the deeper, true to mythology way of viewing the, the fae or the fair folk. Um, definitely enjoyed that. I actually enjoyed hearing a fictional book or a novel through audiobook a lot more than I did something like an astrology book, so I'm not as opposed to the audiobook format, although I can't see myself listening to them often. It was perfect for a road trip where I have to drive for many hours. It actually helped to keep my focus a bit more than music and helped to pass the time, but if I'm just driving around town or doing anything shorter than a drive that's a few hours, I can't see myself turning on an audiobook. The same goes for if I was working out or walking. I would really want to be able to sit with that for the better part of a few hours rather than have just like 15 or 30 minute segments of listening to an audiobook. So I guess I'm coming to learn how audiobooks might be able to fit into my life, but they they require a more specific set of circumstances, which would be something like a few hours allocated to them, and it would mostly be for fictional novels. That being said, that takes us through the books that I read this month. I hope that those were helpful. I always enjoy speaking to the books in these favorites videos the most, actually. So moving into more miscellaneous items, one that I have to share that I recently picked up, so it's definitely not complete, is this I guess prompted journal or journal full of prompts. It's called Burn After Writing by Sharon Jones. I would consider this to be one of those more kitschy ones. I got it at Target. It's kind of in the realm of that more now pop, pop culture, manifestation, self-reflection, self-help kind of category, which I'm not always a fan of. And there are a bunch of flops, in my opinion, in, in that category, uh, not to hate on anything out there, but I did think that this one would be fun. I picked up one for myself and for a friend thinking that we could work on them together because we have similar goals and we've just been talking about this a lot. So it was something I thought I could use with another person and make it more of a group experience. And that was really the driving force behind this. But for me, it seems to be a really great way to self-reflect, I guess in some way shadow work, but really it's about self-awareness and understanding oneself in a way that's hopefully going to help you engage better in life, make better choices, um, feel more purposeful going forward. I journal quite a bit, I journal every day, but being asked very poignant questions or running through exercises that I may not have come up with for myself is something that kind of can 
take me out of my own comfort zone when I am coming up with a question for myself. Of course, I'm anticipating it. It can't be too far out of my comfort zone or I may be making myself uncomfortable intentionally, which I may be pulling punches. So it's nice to see things like, I'm trying to find, some of these are a little bit actually difficult and some of them are more open-ended prompts. Sometimes you have to like check boxes and circle things. So it does keep your interest in regards to the types of exercises. Um, one of them is to answer these sorts of open-ended prompts. I can never respect. If I could change my first name, what would I change it to? If I was trapped in a TV show, what would it be? If I could lock one person in a room and torment them for the day, what would that person be? So that's kind of a little bit like sadistic and out there. And even trying, even reading that made me uncomfortable. And the idea of trying to put my head in that space to even come up with what that would look like, if I could even come up with that or fathom it, um, very, very interesting and definitely uncomfortable. Um, one thing I don't mind spending a lot of money on, if I had a brainwashing machine, I would use it on. So that one seemed to actually speak to morals and ethics, that series of pages or that page. So yeah, very, very interesting actually for me. So I'll be excited to see. I've completed just a little bit of it. I'm hoping to finish it this month and I guess I can give a more thorough review on my experience with it at that time. Another, I guess, journal related prompt if we're going through the miscellaneous, we'll get through all the, the related ones is this one. I guess it's like an idea diary. It's a small little journal. I picked it up thinking that I would fill it with little like animations or doodles. The way that I kind of went about it is to make something that seems creative, that may be more simplistic or artistic and have it showcase an experience. I'm trying to see if any of them are like, that I would feel comfortable sharing. Let's see. Okay, I guess I'll share this like beginning one. No, wait, here, I don't like that one. I I decided I decided otherwise. Um, okay, we'll do this. So this is what this segment of pages looks like. So they're just little doodles and maybe I include a few words, but they are meant to encapsulate an experience or a thought or something that was kind of a, a milestone for me in some way. Maybe it was just capturing the mood that I felt on any given day and looking at it can then engender those feelings. It's not meant to make sense to anybody but myself, but I figured it would be a little bit of a different way of approaching journaling as opposed to writing down every thought and feeling and trying to showcase the experience through words. I have things like a snake flees a cracking egg with this one. And of course that means something to me. It's probably not going to mean much to you watching this, apologies. Uh, and then we have the second one, what does time mean to death? Nothing. Uh, eternal is the thing that isn't and then crappy cycle and then have this little skull and a chaotic whirlwind cycle thing going on here and then a sort of clock like device at the bottom um, so been using it in that way had a few fun experiences that I showcased and as I progressed they began to get a different degree of specificity that which is why I'm probably not sharing those ones, but very, very interesting for me to kind of venture into that way of, I guess, just expression. So there's that. And then of course I have my journal that I currently have been using. I will say in the past few weeks, I've had trouble keeping up with the daily journaling practice. So I may have to shift it and, and switch it up. I've just been having trouble becoming inspired and feeling like I can sit down to do certain things. Although I am doing better in recent days than I was for the beginning parts of this month and last month, so that's always good. So I have been kind of jumping back on the horse, but you may know that I've been using the sketchbook for my journaling and putting in a doodle and then kind of writing around the doodle every day with my thoughts and interpretations on the playing card and tarot card that I pull. I have my little, I guess, case of, of pens and yeah, they're pretty much all pens. I usually work in pen. So I have my brush pen that I tend to do with that journal, this more portable pen that unfolds. It's a ballpoint, another ballpoint pen, and then these micron markers, which are good for details and drawing and creating. Um, and I've been enjoying using them lately in my sketchbook. So I will say journaling in a sketchbook and adding doodles has expanded and I guess lent itself well to me wanting to try different mediums of journaling and exercises in that way. So. When in doubt, if you feel like your journaling practice is stagnant, maybe switch up the way you're approaching it. And for me, that's been really helpful. So I guess we have it's our own little category today, which would be more so the journals. But now it's on to other miscellaneous, more magical, spiritual type 
tools and items. The first being, and the first one that's in reach, is this box that my aunt brought me. This belonged to my late uncle, and she decided that it would probably be good for me. She said that she thought I could put maybe my tarot decks in it or a tarot deck in it, um, or maybe some of my tools and things. She wasn't sure how I would use it, but just thought I might like it. It's actually really, really nice and ornate and heavy, and it's a very high quality box. I really appreciate it. Um, and it's pretty meaningful in that way. And then inside of it, I think that maybe this was inside it when she went to give it to me, or maybe she put it inside, is this bit of agate, I believe it is. And so kind of just, looks like that and yeah that's been in there I haven't really decided what to do with it yet but maybe I'll put some of my jewelry in it or maybe I'll find a special tarot deck that should go in it or find a way to magically work with it we'll see um yeah that's that now another magical tool to share would be this little pouch that I keep two two rocks in and that may not seem very exciting but it's really about what they do or how I use them. So we have this white and black rock or dark and light rock. And you may have seen in previous videos, I know they've been sitting out on my altar for months. I got them from the beach. I tend to get a lot of my natural tools from the beach because that's where I live close to, but I did find these two and they are essentially the same size, shape and weight. Um, and I've decided to actually put them in that pouch and kind of use them in a divinatory way where if I have a yes or no question, I might use them. If it's more of like, I would say questions that have a very dualistic way or perspective instead of using cards, which would then, you know, tarot cards are not ideal for questions like that, or at least in my opinion, they aren't. And there always tends to be a caveat of yes, but, or yes, and, or yes, if, or no, because, or no, perhaps it's just hard to do those types of questions. So um, I have found that I'm using the, these for those types of questions. I also keep them in my bag for clients. If clients have questions that are a little bit more to the point, dualistic, involve that very blatant yes or no, one or the other type of, of way of going about things. I tend to not like to answer questions like that for clients, or at least I want to fully investigate the complexity. It's not that I won't, but if somebody is more insistent on it, or it seems like that might actually be something that's helpful for them, I'll break these out. And of course, if it's in person, I'll have them select the stone themselves. Um, so I found that to be a really interesting new practice for, for me. Um, another magical type item that I have to share is one that I find really interesting. It arrived actually last month, but because I was away, I really started to get myself acquainted with it and use it this month. And that is this sort of, um, I think it's called a mini altar. I got it on Etsy. I'll try to remember to link the creator's shop below. This one was definitely inspired by Jessie Huntenberg, who I believe showed the one that she got on, I think she showed it on YouTube. You will probably know who Jessie Huntenberg is if you're watching my channel. She has a, a larger channel on, on witchcraft and tarot and all sorts of things. But she shared this and it's very, very cool. Um, you basically will purchase this. You have a few options to get it customized. The creator paints it by hand and paints all these symbols for you. And it's kind of just this little dresser type thing. The top part then can flip up or does flip up. There we are filming. Um, and there's the moon cycles. This was the part that I got to pick a customizable bit for. It has a, um, oh my gosh, what is that? The Celtic, is it the Triscoli? I forget the name, um, but that was a part I got to select. And so you can put things on it and flip it up and down. I've been putting it on my larger altar as a sort of extension or something that I can use. It has these drawers and within the drawers when I ordered it, they are filled with a bunch of things that are then included. And you can choose those types of add-ons, I believe. Um, I'm not sure I have all of them on hand. There was a crystal in there and even inside the drawers, there are um, sorts of, I guess, sigils and signs that are more metaphysical and occult in nature. And let me put that back properly and close the drawer. And then I also, I think I got the one that just had everything in it pretty much. Um, so there's these matches. I know on the creator shop, they also sell other sorts of magical type items that you can buy separately. Um, aside from this, this is the, I think, mini altar. There's a portable one that's even smaller than this that is better for being completely on the go. Although I would say this one could probably be on the go depending on what you're packing, how you're packing. 
Um, these are some matches that were in there. This is a bit of a board with runes and things for um, basically for the pendulum, which is also in there. And along with that, there's a bit of a, a key to the runes, for example, if you're using it in terms of letters, which I found really helpful. And then there were a few other things which I have put in other places because I've been using them. And so they aren't housed in those drawers at the moment, but a few of them actually are housed in the next item, which would be my travel altar. Um, you may have seen that when I was traveling or the video that I filmed where I kind of logged my travels to Florida, I did bring this and there was a full moon. So I ended up breaking this out in a hotel room, my travel altar to do a small ritual and um, that's really great. Here's the Sheila now gig on the inner cover. I have a video where I basically go through my creation of this. Um, I haven't made much of a follow-up as to the ways in which I use it. We have things like my geomancy sticks, but um, just to show a few of the other things that actually would have been housed in the mini altar, there's this I guess a little almost like a rock or clay type thing which is good for incense and there were some incense sticks included in in the mini altar and you could burn them in this and this kind of has its own fun sigil that the creator made um i would i will say that interacting with the creator was such a joy and a pleasure there was a little bit of a delay in the creation and shipping of my mini altar and she was extremely communicative about what was going on with that and actually included a few little extra candles and things um, and that really meant a lot she didn't need to do that so um, that was extremely appreciated i know another thing that came from the mini altar was a sort of handmade or homemade um, protection oil which i really appreciate and like i see that the stick incense i actually put in the mini in the travel altar along with this tea light candle which is in like a little canister which i find really fun and it seems to have the sigil for either fire or water depending on the orientation um, along with a lemnus gate so that's always fun and so i included that and i put those into my travel altar um, just for ease of use and because they're mini in that way so i think that that takes us through the miscellaneous items and i guess i'll try to quickly surmise the events or notable events from the month I drove back from Florida not too late into the month, so that was a more notable experience. Um, I will say my time there felt transformative in a different way than when I went almost now a year ago. Um, I definitely had a different experience, one that was a little bit more, I maybe, I would consider it more of like a tower moment type of, type of situation if I had to really categorize it and be honest about it, but having come back um, I do feel like the dust has settled and I'm doing a lot better now. And there's that. We just had, for example, Memorial Day weekend here in the United States. I'm not sure if that's something that's celebrated elsewhere, or if there are equivalents in other countries, um, but that's a long holiday weekend. So that was really nice and pleasant to experience. And of course, there was uh, the supermoon lunar eclipse that happened not too long ago, which I guess would be considered a major astrological event that many consider to be quite transformative. I personally did as well in my own way. Um, so there was that. And I'll say that it's just, yeah, it's interesting getting into the warmer months and trying to acclimate and adjust my rhythms to what's going on. Uh, I feel almost a little bit remiss and guilty about my activity on YouTube having not posted as much, mostly posting one video a week, whereas for the better part of over a year, I posted two videos. That was essentially what my schedule was like, but not really feeling capable of keeping up with that. Likewise, in the community, I have been trying my best to keep up with all of my friends and acquaintances' videos coming up because so many of you are making wonderful content and I, I usually like to comment really thoughtful things as I'm going about details that I see in the video, um, which I haven't really been doing as much or feeling like I can do, but I have been doing and trying my best to keep up with videos. So if I normally comment on your videos and I haven't, it's really, I, it has nothing to do with your content or your ability. I think you're probably doing a great job and I'm trying my best to watch your videos. Um, things have just been a little bit hectic and I've been a bit out of it, but I would like to get back into the swing of interacting and uh, starting dialogues and having communication in that way when and if possible. 
Um, I also try my best, for example, to respond to every comment on all of my videos. That's something that I've been slipping a little bit on, but I've done my best to backtrack and respond to as many comments, if not all of them. So there's that. Um, but yeah, I guess that takes us through the majority of experiences having taken place this month and the items that would then showcase those experiences or speak to them. I hope that this was fun or interesting or that you got something out of it, maybe a recommendation. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them down below. And I do enjoy watching other favorites videos. So if you've made one, maybe I'll, I have watched it or will be watching it. And if not, if you don't make videos, feel free to let me know what your favorite things are. I know it's fun to share those and I enjoy, I enjoy listening to them or reading them in the comments. So please do, do write those. Uh, I hope you are all well. Like and subscribe if this was fun or interesting. And until next time, bye.